Okay, so um, let's start. Um, so I'm Christopher Gilley of the uh, Vienna Holocaust Library, and we're very pleased to be hosting this event tonight um, as the world's oldest archive of material on the Nazi era and the Holocaust. We also have an interest in other genocides and their aftermaths. And we, so we are a very suitable location for this event. We're based in Russell Square in central London, and you can find out more about our exhibitions, events, and reading room on our website. <clears throat> Tonight's event will involve a panel discussion, and then there should be some time for questions at the end. You're all muted at the moment. You're all muted during the talk, um, but you can put questions in the chat, and then um, one of the, the, the chair will ask them. I'm going now going to hand you over to uh, Dr. Catherine Gilbert, who is a research fellow at Newcastle University and chair of the Ashami Foundation. Thank you very much, Chris, and welcome, everyone. Um, so we, uh, we at the Ashami Foundation are delighted to be collaborating with the Wiener Holocaust Library on this important event this evening. Um, just to say a few words about the Ashami Foundation, um, it's an, a genocide education charity that uses the power of sport and storytelling to build equality, tolerance and lasting peace. Our work foregrounds the voices and experiences of genocide survivors to raise awareness of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and other modern genocides, so that young people and communities can learn lessons from the past and contribute to more tolerant and peaceful societies now and in the future. Now this year marks the 28th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, when more than 1 million Rwandans were killed. And we are now in the period of commemoration known as Kwibuka, which runs from the 7th of April to early July every year. And during this time, Rwandans around the world come together to remember their loved ones and honor the resilience and courage of those who survived the 100 days of atrocity in 1994. And of course, the question of justice is always at the fore, but particularly during the commemoration period. And it is in this context that we offer this reflection on the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, bringing together these three distinguished panelists to discuss the lessons and legacies of the ICTR 28 years after the genocide. And I'd just like to introduce um, our CEO and founder, Eric Morangwa Eugene, who is here in the room with us. And I also have the privilege of introducing the chair of the panel um, for this evening's discussion, Dr. Andrew Wallace, who is an author and researcher into the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi and a newly appointed trustee of the Ashami Foundation, I'm very happy to say. And among his many achievements, um, Dr. Wallace's current book, Stepped in Blood, Akazu and the Architects of the Rwandan Genocide Against the Tutsi, published in 2019, is the result of seven years of detailed investigative research uncovering the lives and motivations of the leading perpetrators of the 1994 atrocities. So I'll now hand over to Dr. Wallace, who will guide the conversation and field questions as well at the end of the panel discussion. So a reminder to please put any questions that you might have in the chat, you can write them um, in the chat function, and we'll try to address as many of these as possible in the Q&A. So I'll hand over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. It's a um, pleasure to be, uh, to be invited by Eric to, um, to chair this, and it's uh, it's a huge pleasure as well for our, our speakers tonight uh, to be able to um, both introduce them to hear what they're going to say. Uh, I think Eric came up with this subject because the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, is it's 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 a bit like in a way the special uh, court in Sierra Leone. It's it's gone under the radar. And yet it is hugely important in what the decisions it made and the decisions it failed to make uh, in its successes and in its failures and the legacy going forward. And I hope this evening we can address some of the those failures and those successes uh, and maybe open the door to research by people watching tonight. Uh, their own research to really have a look at uh, what the tribunal did. Um, we're going to hear from each of the speakers uh, and then please do use the chat function. Uh, there's a little box at the bottom there. Um, if you want to send questions to individual speakers or, or to any of the panelists, 
uh, please do so and we hope we can get through as many questions as possible at the end. Uh, so there we go, uh, Catherine just um, put something in the chat box there. So please do address any questions to the panel and we should have lots of time at the end, I hope. It's a huge subject. Um, just a very brief introduction. Uh, the tribunal itself was set up way back in November 1994, coming only a few months after the end of the genocide against the Tutsi finished. Uh, it's quite remarkable the international community managed to push through this, uh, this special court uh, so quickly, given uh, their reluctance to do anything during the genocide itself, really. Um, some would say it was founded on guilt. Uh, that is uh, for various individuals to decide if that was the case. Uh, there were a lot of successes in the coming years. Uh, 93 individuals were indicted. There were 62 sentenced. Uh, some of them are continuing their sentences. They were sentenced to life. Uh, many have now been acquitted. Uh, many also had their sentences uh, cut short and are now uh, living free lives. Uh, what did the ICTR achieve? Well, most importantly, I suppose, is it set a legal precedent. Uh, it was the first court uh, after the Genocide Convention in 1948 to actually find individuals responsible for genocide. Um, very importantly, also, it saw rape uh, as an act of genocide. And uh, as, as uh, Stephen Rapp will, um, will no doubt tell us about, it saw media, the role of the media in citing genocide uh, was also for the first time um, shown uh, to be a crime of the worst uh, order. Um, the ICTR finished, closed its doors in 2016, and it's now the, there's a mechanism which is trying its best to sort of tie up the loose ends. Uh, and there are a lot of loose ends, and some would say not many of them have been tied up. However, uh, there are also a whole load of possible failures people would point to at the ICTR in areas where it failed to meet out justice. And Ernest, I'm sure, will, will look at the view of these survivors. Um, how well have they been served by the ICTR? It said it was going to give justice. Did it manage to do that? Uh, that's the all important question. That was the principal reason it was set up. So without more ado, because uh, I can uh, go on and on, um, let's start, if we could, with Barbara. Um, and Barbara Mulvaney, uh, it's a huge joy to see you again uh, after many years. <laughs> um, Barbara was the uh, lead attorney or the attorney on the uh, Military One case, probably the most important case, some would say, um, including uh, Theonest Bagasora and Anatol Zengiumva, uh, two, two individuals seen as very much the masterminds of the genocide. Um, uh, through many, many years of the case, um, now uh, back in Santa Fe in Mexico, is New Mexico, where she joins us today. And I am told she is writing a book. She tells me she's writing a book about her time there, which will be fabulous because we do need. Uh, such a book. Um, so, Barbara, without more ado, uh, I hand over to you. Okay, I'm I'm here. I just want to make sure that the the sound is on. Can you hear me? Yep, coming through loud and clear. Great, great. Well, um, I hope that you'll be the ghostwriter on the book, Andrew. So that'll <laughs> help a lot. <laughs> <laughs> It, you know, it is it is a very, very big subject. And I am always worried about talking, not knowing my audience, because, you know, Rwandans um, want to know certain things, people that are involved in international criminal law, 
have another perspective. So um, a Andy has suggested that I start from day one when I arrive. So I think that's what I'll do. And I, I came into the tribunal in 2002. And by then the um, early trials had been done and um, uh, the investigation was done after the, after the genocide itself. And we had certain databases and different things that, that we were working from. But the trial that I, I took over, I got there six weeks before the first witness was called. And so that's when I started. So I was there throughout the whole trial proceeding, which took, uh, it was 440 days over basically four years in court. And we called 242 witnesses. And um, I was not alone in this quest. And I just wanna honor my team because they were really, a great group, but I'll just give you the first names. So it's it's uh, Christine, Rashid, Drew. Those were the three other lawyers that were in court all the time with me. And then we had Freddie and uh, Abdu and uh, Deb and Kartik that were working behind the scenes. And so it was a quite a big production. But basically what, what our case covered and, I, and I'm looking at it, we had four defendants. We had uh, General Kabaligi, um, um, Colonel in, in Tabakuzi, who was the head of the Paracommandos. We had Bagasora, who was a basic, at that point he was, uh, he was retired military and he was the chef de cabinet of the, of the, of the defense department. And then also in Singiumva, Anatole in Singiumva, who was a former intelligence head of intelligence, but he was the, the commander up in Gassini Ops uh, in the northern part of Rwanda. And it was um, basically a massive case. So one of the first things we did is uh, we set up a database uh, to try to capture all the information. And the reason I'm telling you that is because what we did is picked out the top 40 issues that we were going to have to deal with. And um, basically, I can try to go through them because uh, we usually start in the night of the plane crash, which was April uh, 6th, the night of April 6th. And at that time, we basically have a minute by minute accounting of that in our trial. And so Bagasora took over um, the, the command in, in Kigali. Um, there was the killing of the prime minister and the rape of the prime minister. Uh, who was in charge, there was then, it was basically what we call it, we call it a coup. It was not charged that there is no criminal, <laughs> there's no criminal offense for a coup, but it was a coup. And so they, they killed off all the political opposition, uh, including um, Justice Kavar Ruganda, who was the head of the constitutional court and uh, the different, different ministers. So they, they, killed, they killed them. And then they also killed the, 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 the Belgian uh, peacekeepers. And so it was an orchestrated event that happened that night. And then the genocide itself started. So that's, that's part of the core. But even preceding that, we actually presented testimony on the planning of the genocide, the, um, the organization of the militia, the um, basically the history from 1990 on where it actually in 1990, they it's an episode where, where the uh, government called a false, they, they called an attack on Kigali and they rounded up all the political opposition and they um, killed many of them. So we actually go back to 1990 in our case and even earlier trying to reconstruct the context in which it all happened. So, so most people hear about the genocide in Rwanda, but there are so many other things that you need to look at when you look at the context of how that happened. And so we look at that with the lists that were created and um, just the orchestration that happened prior to the start of the genocide. So all of that was part of our case. And then we had, the massacres that went on 
all over the all over the the country in the hundred days that was the genocide against the Tutsis, and those were um, you know in Gitarama, up in Gassini, in Busasamana Church, in um, different areas uh, in in uh, Butare, and basically all over the country. So our task was uh, pretty overwhelming. And so we were doing this within the context of the UN system. So the UN system, we had, they basically had set up the tribunal and it's, it was a thousand people. Uh, it, it was a international staff that was moved into a, a town in Tanzania, in Arusha, basically a town with no paved roads. And we put together, they put together Together, a, a whole tribunal. So um, Andrew talks about the 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 many uh, complaints, maybe about about the ICTR. But in defense of the ICTR, it was pretty much an impossible task, and um, I'm pretty proud that we got it done. So um, and so, I, some of my lawyers that I've talked to in the last year or so. They, they're the ones that told me, Barbara, you know that it was an impossible trial. <laughs> I go, no, I didn't know that, but, but we actually got it done. And so it involved, um, when I say 242 witnesses, we had um, a lot of difficulties bringing everybody together. And so it was, um, we would go out into the field um, out into Rwanda and other countries trying to actually beg people to come testify. That was one of the problems is people were not terribly cooperative. And the Rwandans were cooperative um, to a great deal. And they, they helped us throughout. And uh, although there were different issues at different times, I'm sorry to not, not see Martin Ngoga here because Martin Ngoga was the ambassador, the Rwandan ambassador to the ICTR. And whenever I had a problem, uh, Martin would help me. He would help us get witnesses. And, and so we were all very appreciative. There were other countries that did not help at all. And France comes to mind. And so we did have problems getting witnesses out of France and um, getting the information out of France. Um, the US uh, helped sometimes. Uh, many of their diplomats that were there, um, were very reluctant to help. And one actually came in and, and testified for the defense. That was the only one that actually made it there. So um, they helped in some ways, um, but it was, it was a difficult situation. And, and I'm, I can talk about the facts of the case, but it's, it's difficult and it's gut-wrenching. And I'm, I'm happy to do that if people have specific questions but I really want to focus more on the tribunal itself and how we, how we put it together and the difficulties we had, because I think it's very important um, for other, for many reasons. And um, one is, and, and I think we're going to talk about it in, in more depth, is how the information that we generated at the tribunal is passed on to the next to the people that need the information. And that's in the archives. And, and the reason I bring it up is that um, in the trial itself, we had protective witnesses and the protected witnesses uh, was greatly overused at the tribunal. And we had over, I saw a statistic, over 60%, 60, 60 maybe 70% of the witnesses were protected, which meant it was done in private. It was done um, without public view, and it's not information that is now um, put into, the, into an open archive where people can actually see what we produced. And I'd like to talk about that um, with the other panelists at some point, because I think it's very important. So we had quite, and I'll describe the courtroom to you. We had on our side, we had um, the three lawyers and myself, um, in the courtroom. On the defense side, we had, each defendant had three, at least three lawyers. One was an assistant, but the two major lawyers, and then an investigator. So 
On the other side of the courtroom, we had uh, at least 20 people. And we had very, very well informed, the defendants themselves were very, very well informed, obviously, because it, it, was, it was a lot of our, our factual situations took place on military bases. And so for, for a long time, it was hard for us to even get on the military bases, but the, the guys on the other side of the courtroom all knew it intimately. So that was the four defendants. So it was, we were always sort of, um, I always thought we were behind the eight ball on some of these things where we didn't have the information we needed. But um, one of the things that when I want, what I wanted to talk about is the problems that we had. Um, the problems we had during, during the case itself. And one of the things was um, we had a constant, we, had, we didn't have the personnel that they had at the ICTY. That was our sister tribunal that was doing the former Yugoslavia. And so up there, I always felt like they had a, a, a lot more personnel. They had more specialists. We didn't have um, a gender specialist or a rape specialist, so that we, we were really on our own in a lot of a lot of the situations, and so we we had to improvise. And one thing I want to do before before I forget, I've been known to forget things, but um, I wanted to talk about the rape the rape uh, case that we put together, and you know the genocide itself was over a million people. And I, and I think that the numbers are greatly underestimated on the rapes. I think the rapes were, were hundreds of thousands because they were going on everywhere. It was just horrific. And so what we were faced with is we, we had a judge that told us that we were restricted to 100 witnesses. And 100 witnesses when you have four defendants with the fact pattern that is so huge is not very many. And so at one point, one of my one of the lawyers came into my office and she was crying. And she goes, what are we gonna do about the rape victims? And I'm going, God, I don't know. And we had 20 that were down, but our defendants were not, we didn't charge them for personally raping anyone. We charged them under command responsibility that they knew or should have known that they were going on and they didn't prevent it. And so we actually made a, a decision to cut the rape victims out of the, out of the lineup and to which they were very relieved, the victims. And we put together a rape database and we brought in an expert, which was Benifer Naroji. And she was teaching human rights at Harvard. She's um, a, an exceptional woman. And um, she came, she did the rape database she got the students at Harvard to put together a whole, um, a whole package where they analyzed everything. And it was actually very effective, but it, it, and what she talked about were the common patterns that you saw, that it was open. And the one that was so helpful to us was that it was open and notorious. And so the rapes were going on in public and the people uh, and that the, the officials didn't stop them. And so we actually, um, we ended up with a conviction against Bagasora for the rapes in the first, you know, say five or six days of the, of, the, of the genocide itself at the roadblocks at different places. And we convicted him for rape. But, but one of the problems that we had is that, uh, and it brings me to another issue that we have. And these are, these are more, uh, uh it, it's an issue that that is important because I think it's happened others and will happen to others in the future is that the, the laws were not set the rules of evidence were not set when we were in the court we had 82 different nationalities at the tribunal so we we had a skeleton set of rules that we were going from and those rules are, are basically what govern what comes into the court, what's going to be considered for a judgment. And um, at the beginning of our trial, which is closer to when uh, Benifer testified, the rape expert, um, the rules were not established. And they actually, the defense, whenever, I find it sort of interesting because it seems like 
Men in particular get really upset when rape is charged. And the defendants just found that the rape, the concept of rape convictions appalling, and they just were horrified. And so they, they argued strenuously, and they actually kept out part of our rape database. And um, I bring that up because, you know, in our courtroom, at the end of the four years, back, you know, say year number two, even number, number three, the, the rules got looser and looser. And so here we had an expert who had analyzed everything, and she was not allowed to testify about certain parts of it. And that was in the first year of trial. The, four, the, the third year of trial, the defense, one of the defense counsel comes in with a dolly with at least three boxes of documents we had never, ever seen. And he tried to put them into evidence and the judge allowed them. And so it's just the contrast in the beginning, which was the prosecution case, and what we were allowed to bring in and the defense case at the end, the rules had totally changed. And, and we had this, this also happen with the Court of Appeals where the, the information that we were relying on, say in indictments and other things and the rules, they changed continuously while we were in court. And so my, the lawyers would come to me, they go, my God, did you see that decision that came down from The Hague? It says on the indictment, you have to do this, this, and this. And I looked at him and I go, we're already in trial. We've been in trial for two years. What are we supposed to do about that? You know, And it's uh, basically an ex, ex post facto law that comes up while you're already in court, everything's already happened and they're switching the law and changing that law. And that's what they're going to do the final judgment on. So that was a, that was another problem that we had. And I see Andrew like I think he's looking at yeah. a clock, and I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, I, am. I am. I think. I think that's <laughs> you raised so much there. We've got a, <laughs> well, a bunch of meat to come back well, to. Well, but, well um, I hope so because you know I'm sorry I'm not giving. Sometimes people go, well, you didn't tell us. We did convict people. We convicted them for genocide, crimes against humanity, yeah. lots of different things. But I'm yeah. I'm hoping that I'm hitting some of the issues that might yeah. be of interest to people. I, I, absolutely, I think that's all we can do tonight is really just bring up. Um, but thank you so much for for those thoughts, initial thoughts. We'll certainly be coming back to you. Um, Stephen, can we come to you uh, next? Just because I can see you in... in <laughs> you're, Certainly, you're, very, very happy to, to join you. The, the, lovely. Um, and for those who don't know Stephen, uh, Stephen Rapp, um, very briefly, there's so, so many things you're involved with, uh, but I think most pertinent uh, with you, uh, the, the prosecutor at the media trial, Ferdinand, uh, near Mana and Hassan Ngezi, et cetera, uh, as well as the, the prosecutor at the special court in Sierra Leone uh, and um, have so many other arrows to your bow since then, uh, including at the, um, uh, the US Holocaust Museum and US State uh, Department ambassador at large for war crimes. Um, so let me, Hand over to you, uh, Stephen, uh, for your thoughts. Thank you. Well, and, uh, thank you, Andrew. And it's good to be my, with my friend Barbara and with other people that I know. And uh, and, and uh, always um, pleased to, to talk about the work of, of the ICTR. Uh, as Barbara, I mentioned a, a little of, of my personal arrival and, and dealing with the challenges of the place. Uh, but uh, but I do want to note uh, in regard to the to the media trial. Uh, and the judgment that we reached in it, it's, it's one that I think uh, continues uh, to resonate. Uh, it, of course, uh, we thought extremely important from the point of view of Rwanda, because certainly in my view, um, and, and from the evidence that we had, uh, the reason that the genocide happened in, on, on, in every commune and, and on every hill that uh, was under the control of the interim government was in part because of the media. It was the it was the air support. It was the command control communications. It was uh, sending the messages. It was encouraging uh, the killers. It was sometimes directing them uh, to, to their victims. Uh, and of course, there were others, uh, uh, the military, uh, uh, the case that Barbara led that was, was out there uh, 
uh, frankly, organizing it, uh, corralling people into these places where they thought they were safe, uh, sometimes attacking them with uh, with grenades and, and, and heavy weapons uh, so that the entire Hanway could, could come in and, and, and do the horrible business of hacking and, 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 and tearing the life out of men, women and children. Um, but uh, the, the people that were doing that uh, were hearing uh, hearing from the radio uh, why they should do it and and, uh, and 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 directing them and encouraging them and and, and frankly uh, creating almost uh, a world in which what was wrong before uh, became uh, became right and uh, and and the way in which it communicated uh, uh, and and the decisions that were reached in regard to incitement to genocide and and our judgment wasn't perfect and some of what happened in the appeals chamber uh, took back some of what we won in the in, in the trial uh, but I th think still uh, uh, given its importance in Rwanda uh, and and an understanding the genocide uh, also resonates to a great extent uh, around the world I remember during the uh, 25th uh, Kabuka uh, being in, in uh, East a in, the, in the Asia Pacific region and, and speaking together with members and joining on panels, members who had just sat on the fact-finding mission, uh, the UN fact-finding mission for, for Myanmar and the, the genocide of, of the Rohingya. And, and a lot of what they had found is that the social media, that Facebook accounts controlled by the military had been the means by which a communication was made that had been incited uh, the, the killing of uh, and, and, and other crimes of, of brutality, but uh, all with the effect of of attempting to destroy the Rohingya people, uh, that that was uh, incitement to genocide and that one could look at the, the case law from the ICTR and, and apply it in, in other situations. And uh, with RTLM, of course, we had a, a radio station developed by the, by, the, by the Hutu extremist party, by the party president Javier Mana when, uh, uh, when they had lost uh, control, at least of the Ministry of Information uh, during the pre-genocidal period. Uh, uh, when they, um, you know, there was a coalition government, and, and when they, when an opposition party took control of, of of that ministry, and they formed this this radio, and it was an FM radio station, and and they, uh, you know, put up the transmitters and 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 got a license with promises that it wouldn't do any incitement, and uh, and and uh, and then hired announcers that uh, that were more that were football announcers, and that were frankly. Uh, 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 you know, in terms of their uh, of, of their attraction and, and entertainment value, uh, there were the, the radio became enormously popular because the, for that radio Rwanda had been completely boring, and and here this here this was and it was a it was a low tech uh, kind of thing. And now, frankly, in the world, uh, we have uh, massive amounts of ways in which extremists and those that would uh, engender hate and and call for for the destruction of, of enemies uh, can use uh, these tools and uh, hopefully we can apply the, the same law uh, to them and, and particularly the law of incitement uh, to genocide which doesn't require you prove that the specific communication led to a specific death it's it's sufficient that there be the intent to communicate that and that it be communicated into a situation in which uh, uh, the, the the listeners understand it uh, and in which there is a, a serious possibility uh, that they will uh, they will act on it, uh, whether or not they do. Um, but in terms of the trial itself, as you noted, it involved Ferdinand Nahimana uh, and Hassan Ngeze. It also involved John Bosco Baraguiza, uh, uh, Nahimana, very you know, uh, the most dignified defendant there wore a suit and tie and uh, and gold glasses uh, every day. Was represented by a British QC and a famous French attorney and. Uh, uh, you know, had a PhD, a doctorate with great distinction from the University of Paris, uh, tried to act as if he was uh, just a distinguished uh, scholar of African history. Uh, when, if you dug into his past, he was a, a complete extremist, and in our view, frankly, the, the Joseph Goebbels of the, of the, of, of the Rwandan uh, uh, genocide. Uh, but uh, uh, when you went to the, uh, proving the case against him, uh, you were challenged uh, then by the need to show that the messages on RTLM were in fact inciting. Before I go there, mention the other defendant, John Bosco Baraguiza. Bosco Baraguiza had been uh, essentially the legal advisor on the establishment of the radio, uh, was of course also more famous for having been the founder of the CDR political party, the party that was even to the extreme of the MRND, sort of put out there in order to create a kind of a second party on the extremist wing. 
Uh, before that, had been the uh, secretary to the secretary general of the OAU, had been the, 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 uh, the permanent secretary of the, of the foreign ministry, a very prominent individual, but, a, but an incredible extremist. And uh, in one of the Sarrio episodes in the tribunal before we got there, at one point he was ordered released because of a long delay in him appearing at being brought into court after he was arrested in Cameroon. Fortunately, that was reversed and his case was joined to ours because of the media connection. He was so outraged, he refused to come to trial and he had attorneys appointed uh, to represent him. Um, obviously, these two men, Nahiman and Barguiza, were uh, of a, you know, they both uh, had degrees, uh, uh, Barguiza had his from, from Romania, uh, but uh, they were highly educated and, and prominent individuals. Uh, but then we had Hassan and Geze, who was uh, more of a huckster, a street a kid that had run a propaganda, uh, uh, sort of a broadsheet gossip uh, newspaper or magazine uh, uh, during the 80s, and had frankly been subsidized by the extremists to start another magazine, uh, the, the the movie at the you know at Kangura, I mean, the really sort of more of a magazine, uh, but uh, but a, but a. <laughs> uh, an incredibly uh, inciting and, and hateful paper, uh, famous for uh, its uh, Ten Commandments against uh, 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 of the, the of the Bahutu uh, to hate Tutsis, not to ever have any pity on Tutsis. It may have even inspired the the, the club with a nail in it that was called the No Pity Club during the during the Rwandan uh, genocide. Uh, Kambanda. Uh, who confessed but never testified in his confession that Ngezi actually brought out in court because he was so proud of it, uh, actually it said that on Kangura there was incitement on every single page. Uh, there was even incitement in the uh, advertisements. Uh, that, th so the challenge with, with him uh, was showing that, that, the, radio, that the, news, the newspaper, the magazine, which didn't print during the genocide, had committed direct and public incitement to genocide by the articles that he had published in the year that we had jurisdiction, 1994, which didn't include uh, uh, the, the, the period of, um, of, 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 say, the Hutu Ten Commandments. Uh, the challenge with, with the radio, and, and I arrived and took over the trial of, of the second week after I came to Arusha in May of 2001, about a year before Barbara came, and I was put in charge of the trial because the the first, the first leader had been fired and the second leader had, had gone off to uh, East Timor. And, um, and we had been going for about seven months at that point. And I said, well, have we proven up the radio broadcasts? <laughs> and uh, well, we have 345 tapes. And I said, well, how many of them are translated into English or, or French? And it was about 50. They said, they're too hard and the translation bureau doesn't want to do them. And so it was hard to prove what they had actually put on. Now, eventually we hired experts on the side that, uh, that, that dug uh, through them. Uh, in fact, the 345 hours were only 273. None of them were made by RTLM. They were all made by third parties who were listening on, on, on cassette radio and were recording them on cassette tapes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and of course, proving that they were what they were was difficult. Only one of the 16 sources would appear as a witness. Uh, eventually because of an expert and listening to all of them and timing them and working out the days that they were, uh, that they were presented, uh, we were eventually able to get the court to accept those 273 broadcasts. Of course, they didn't include many of the expressions that were reported as having been said on the radio, uh, but, and, and they required an enormous amount of sort of cultural decoding. Uh, but uh, eventually uh, we were successful uh, with expert team and, of, of, of identifying uh, particularly what I call uh, 30 most egregious segments of broadcasts. And in, in each case, it required an understanding of, of, of the context. Uh, uh, but, you know, there would be broadcasts in which they would say that one of the soccer announcers, uh, Kentano Hamimana, on June 4th, uh, 1994, would say, uh, we know the enemy. Uh, we know him by that small nose. Break that nose. And you realize this uh, stereotypical physiognomy. You wouldn't be breaking the nose of an RPF soldier that was uh, was in the war. You'd be breaking the nose of 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 of, 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 a, of a Tutsi based upon based upon physical appearance. Uh, before I arrived, we had a witness. I think it was FW uh, that appeared also in Barbara's case, uh, who'd been in the rafters of the Gaddafi Mosque uh, in, in Nyam Rambo. Uh, for like 60 days of the genocide and had been there managing to escape, hiding out and in wrecked cars that were around the, the area sometimes in the attic and, 
and uh, while people were taken out of the mosque and, and, and killed. Uh, it was there on the day that uh, one of the uh, announcers, Noel Hikimana, drove up and there were neighbors trying to feed people across the fence uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the mosque and, and said, don't, don't feed those in Yenzi. And uh, then Noel Hikimana goes on the radio and, and denounces what's going on and talks about how there are people, there are in Kontani uh, alleging that there are soldiers, uh, uh, RPF soldiers there. There were not, never, not there, not till the 60th day of the genocide were there any RPF soldiers that finally liberated the area. Uh, they're there for the slaughter. They're gonna be slaughtered today or slaughtered tomorrow, but like cattle will be slaughtered. So we were able to eventually uh, show in a variety of things with the context, where it was, what, what it all had meant, uh, and, and convict the radio. <laughs> but of course, the radio wasn't on trial. Uh, we had to prove that, that Nahimana and Baraguiza uh, were responsible for those broadcasts. And they had been essentially the founders of the radio, but they had never gotten formal positions. The best we had was a, a reporter, Sans Frontier uh, expert, Philip de Hinden, who had come in 1993 and had actually met with a station manager and he'd identified Nahimana as numero un and, and, and Baraguizer as numero deux. <laughs> and so we had that sort of informal acknowledgement of, of their role and the fact that there was a committee of initiative that they had never formed a board of directors uh, that in the period of early 94 actually occasionally disciplined people, but usually disciplined them for um, uh, for causing some uh, Hutu to be attacked. They would actually get the guy and suspend him because of, of some mistake that he had made. So it was possible to show that the radio and the management of Nanyamana had control uh, over, over the broadcast. Uh, but um, even though Nahimana visited the radio once, he left Rwanda on April 12th to Burundi where he was declared persona non grata, went into Zaire, was pushed out of there uh, spent the first uh, 45 days of the genocide in Chengdu, uh, but eventually uh, was, uh, was asked by the interim government to assist in negotiations with the French. <laughs> and uh, it was out of those communications that were eventually able to nail him because uh, uh, the French, and we can uh, obviously uh, uh, talk about Operation Turquoise and, 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 and the ways in which it often abandoned people to, to their deaths, uh, but uh, uh, the interim government was very unhappy that Operation Turquoise was only moving into the southwest part of the country and wasn't going into their, uh, to their sacred northwest where the Akazu came from. And, uh, and they uh, wanted Nahimana to go to Goma, which he did, uh, and meet the French and say, you can't, uh, uh, you've got to come into the northwest. French rejected that. Uh, but then they also said, now you're running, <laughs> you're running RTLM. Uh, and uh, you continue to denounce Dallaire, Dallaire, and we don't get along, but we don't want you to be announcing another UN mission. This is really bad. You have to stop. And Nahimana said we'd stop, and they did. And it was on that fact, uh, 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 what happened in the radio in the last two weeks, the fact that any denunciations of Dallaire had ended, uh, that was the basis upon which the judges held that, in fact, Nahimana continued to have effective control of the radio the same kind of thing he'd had before, before April and, and could change the broadcast, could stop the denunciation. And, and on that basis, and, and frankly, at the end of the day, uh, uh, only on that basis uh, was, was he held uh, responsible. Um, obviously, uh, Barguiza to a large extent was held responsible for his activities within the CDR and, uh, and uh, um, uh, to, for broadcasts that occurred before April. Uh, 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 April 6th. And in Gaze, it was less challenging. Uh, the judges did find uh, that his, his communications, including the one that was published uh, uh, just before the genocide began, in which he talked about how something's going to happen, and when it does, uh, no accomplice will be left alive in Rwanda. He tried to argue that was just political prediction, but that was, in fact, the plan. Uh, they anticipated, uh, frankly, that there would be uh, 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 something that would occur, which turned out to be the plane crash. And at that point, as, as, not, as Dallaire's informant uh, uh, had told him, uh, they were ready to kill a thousand Tootsies every 20 minutes. And, 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 and it indeed uh, happened. Uh, and, and indeed happened in part because uh, people had been um, focused on doing it by, by, by the propaganda. Um, in, in the end, at, at trial, uh, each of them were convicted 
uh, the judges found uh, uh, they were each entitled to a life term, uh, gave it to them. Uh, uh, uh was shortened because of the because of the of the violation uh, earlier uh, of 35 years. Fortunately, their their sentences were uh, further shortened uh, uh, by the by by the appeals chamber. But uh, but and and obviously the RT uh, uh, the, the tribunal went on, uh, continued working uh, there and and working and becoming chief of prosecutions. Uh, uh, working with all of the trial teams before I left for, for Sierra Leone in, in January of, of, of 2007. Uh, uh, you know, I'm certainly aware of and, 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 and feel deeply about places where the tribunal failed and, and, and could, have, uh, could have done better. I do recall, however, uh, uh, the, the, the day, uh, and it'll certainly be one of the most gratifying days of my life, uh, the 3rd of December, uh, 2003, uh, when, when the judges brought in uh, their, their judgment and, and convicted uh, each of these powerful men and, and made them stand, convicted them for genocide, convicted them for direct and public incitement to genocide, the first people in history ever to be so convicted because that crime didn't exist uh, to use against, you know, uh, uh, Streicher uh, 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 at, uh, at Nuremberg. And, uh, and I can remember... Uh, as meeting with 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 those who were watching and Rwandans who who, who described um, how, how much that meant that, that meant that they said we couldn't be in the room with them they were so powerful they were so far above uh, any of us and 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 they set in motion and did these things that killed our entire families and today they've been made to stand before all the world and, and felt guilty of the crime of crimes and and we and vindicated now, not uh, not made whole, never made whole, and and not re and no reparations, and, and 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 not conviction for everything they did, uh, but uh, but it, it, it I think was a was a powerful message sent in in these judgments and and, and back to Soros and the others convictions in military one and and the others that were convicted uh, in in this uh, in this tribunal, and and something for which um, I think. Uh, uh, with with all its uh, weaknesses, uh, the, I'm, I'm I'm immensely proud to, to, to play the role there. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much, you. Stephen. Thank you. That's, um, again, there's huge amounts there to um, to think about and to to take away. And and you've touched on wonderfully two two areas which uh, I'm hoping Ernest can uh, can take up as well in his thoughts. Um, and it, it's an actual pleasure to introduce Ernest, uh, who's coming from Brussels, I believe, uh, joining us from Brussels, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, he was uh, coming late in the day uh, onto our panel. Thank you so much. Uh, Ernest is the, um, the head of human rights and safety at the International Federation of Journalists, um, himself a uh, journalist of many years, and most pertinently, uh, the president of Ibuka in uh, Belgium, the Survivors Association. Um, so without further ado, Ernest, let me hand over to you for your thoughts. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for everybody. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for having me and for organizing this, uh, this debate. Um, I wonder if I may, um, just to put um, a perspective uh, of, of, of Rwanda. No? I, I, I'm going to have to try and um, uh, speak uh, on behalf of uh, Rwandans who were witnessing or trying to follow uh, what was going on at the ICTR. Now, I was very privileged to work for the BBC and uh, throughout the uh, life of the ICTR, we try our best to cover the um, uh, the, the work of the tribunal. And I was also very fortunate thereafter to join the International Criminal Court as, uh, as uh, its official spokesperson. And I got to know uh, more closely the workings of these uh, international uh, jurisdictions. Now, ACTR has come in for many criticism, uh, some of which are warranted and, and, uh, and legitimate, and some probably not, not uh, legit legitimate. But uh, I guess everybody has got a uh, right to their opinion. But <clears throat> really what I would like to say, and it's very interesting to hear from uh, first-hand experience uh, from people who uh, were involved uh, as, as, uh, as counsel at the SCTR, 
But this, it, in, in my view, the ICTR was actually a unique endeavor, a unique endeavor by which the international community tried to do the next best thing, having failed and failed miserably to prevent the genocide against the Tutsi. Uh, at the same time, why are they trying to do what, what, what could be described as the next best thing to do in the wake of the genocide against the Tutsi? It was also a very strange setting. It was a setting whereby uh, judges were mostly foreigners, uh, defense counsel, even uh, prosecution uh, were also foreigners. I mean, not, not Rwandans, I mean, and the whole thing taking place miles away from Rwanda. And that brings to mind the saying that out of sight, out of mind. And as I said, uh, media organizations try their best to cover, uh, to cover the, the work of the tribunal. But given the limited time they had, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I can't venture to, 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 uh, to confirm. But I wonder how, to what extent, actually Rwandans knew what was going on at the FCTR. But to the extent the world, and somewhere, because I know I having talked to many, somewhere indeed uh, following what was going on, the, the enduring legacy of that tribunal will be from the stand viewpoint of Rwandans, especially victims of the survivors of the genocide, it will be that it actually secured the most important thing for them to establish the reality of what happened. Of what happened, of what happened. The ICTR established in no uncertain terms that indeed genocide did take place and it was targeting Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994. And I think to me and to many of my countrymen and countrywomen, that is a big deal, um, especially now when we are dealing with uh, uh, the rise of uh, the, the denial of the genocide, we can look to the work of the ICTR this foreign setting, quote unquote, uh, has actually established for everybody to see that uh, these people are victims of a plan to exterminate them all uh, in, in Rwanda. And that is a really a big thing. And the other enduring legacy in my view will be, and of course, this will be particularly interesting for lawyers. I am one of them. Uh, we, we can look at the, the considerable body of legal precedent, which was uh, set by the ICTR, we can actually look even uh, at what the development, both in uh, international criminal justice, like the creation of the ICC, which actually was uh, a result in many ways uh, of the SCTR trying to remedy whatever was perceived as the weaknesses uh, of these ad hoc uh, tribunals. So that, that to Rwandans, we hope we can look at that and say, okay, we were victims of this horrible uh, genocide against the Tutsi, but at least we have given the world something which in the future might help prevent other genocide taking place. And I, I, and I want to, to pay tribute um, to victims who very patiently uh, were waiting for justice uh, from the CTR. In some cases it did come because as you, have, as you have said, there have been a lot of convictions, uh, including by a former head of government, Mr. Kambanda, uh, and that's, that's nothing to, 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 that's very big deal as well. And also uh, some military commanders, including, I was going to say, uh, some leading journalists and uh, having worked for journalists for many years, it was something that uh, I look at uh, with any pride, uh, quite the contrary. Um, but the, the fact is, uh, as, as I think Stephen said, um, the, the, the air wave was a, a, a kind of weapon uh, trying to incite people to kill each other, especially to kill Tutsi. And for them to be held accountable is something also which will, will stand as a cautionary tale and as a lesson for, for journalists, not only in Rwanda, but in other countries. And I know for a fact that in, in many African countries, for instance, because I, I've been to some of them, where like Burkina Faso being one of them, Ivory Coast being another, whenever there was this trouble, political troubles, unrest, when media was trying to get involved, there have been people who stood up and say, careful, you know what happened to RTLM, Radio Television de Mercorin, and you know the consequences of those who got involved in that. So it's a cautionary tale for us, which of course I, I welcome. And the other thing I want to also touch on uh, and to agree with, with uh, Barbara, um, and, and 
unfortunately wasn't really brought about uh, during the proceedings. I, I can understand the reason for what for that. Uh, really, the coup d'état, which was in a way, in a way, was what set in motion the genocide. Not no, but there were very few people talk about it. But uh, for a lawyer uh, of her experience to to have realized that and to be able to say it is is also something that uh, I, I want to welcome. So. Uh, I know we're gonna come back to it, but uh, let me end on one thing that since I worked for the SEC and something that was uh, tried to was tried to remedy uh, what was missing at the SCTRI and the STY. Uh, victims of the survivors of the genocide against the Tutsi uh, were in a way shortchanged in that, that yes, uh, there was an attempt to secure justice for them, but how do you secure justice? Uh, in the case of genocide. I mean, you can't bring back people who were killed. You can't even alleviate in any way, shape or form the suffering of, of the victims. But what was missing in addition, and they, they, they did say that, they did tell me as a journalist, they did tell that to many journalists, they, they, were, they found it scandalous, absolutely outrageous that those guys who were convicted of the genocide were living in a comfortable way in, in, in their cells in Arusha where victims did not get any reparation at all. And, 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 and that's something that, the, that should have done in my view. And I believe it can still be done, uh, but at least as a legacy again, talking of legacy, the ICC uh, tried to remedy to that by creating what they call the funds for victims, which helps uh, to uh, fund some development projects uh, or looking after victims of uh, massive crimes, including genocide, uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes. And that's something that I hope uh, governments and international community, even at this late hour, can look at and, and, and decide what can be done to help uh, those survivors of the Tutsi genocide in Rwanda. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ernest, for your, again, you've touched on many, many areas there. Um, well, there's, Plenty of questions. We've got around half an hour. Uh, we've had some questions through. Do if you're uh, joining us and you have a question, do use the, uh, the the chat box at the bottom there to uh, put a question through uh, if you'd like. Let me just fire um, a question through to to any of the panelists really, um, just to start us underway, which is on the importance of location. Um, right at the very start, it was decided that this court was going to be established a thousand kilometers away from the crime scene, uh, which has a huge amount of issues. It was decided to put it in Arusha, and Barbara touched on the location. Um, Arusha there had very poor links um, with anywhere, really, just internally in the, in, in the city, but also in terms of IT. Um, and it meant the court uh, had, had real issues if you're a journalist trying to cover because whereas ICTY you could live stream cases, obviously um, the internet was so poor in Arusha you couldn't. So I'm just wondering how big an issue, had the court been located somewhere else, um, would more people have known about it, more people have covered it? If it had been in Rwanda, for example, how do you think um, the ICTR would have responded had it been actually uh, um, put in Kigali to start with. Has, has anyone any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I, since I later got involved in the diplomatic business uh, yeah. uh, of citing courts and how to deal with it, uh, but this is all before my time. I, you know, it was clearly the UN uh, thought there was a security issue to having it in Rwanda. I don't think there was. Uh, but uh, decided uh, to move it nearby, and it was either Nairobi or Arusha, and um, uh, maybe Nairobi would have been better, but it would have been uh, diverting and endless, uh, uh, um, uh, even uh, perhaps uh, harder to, to do the work in, and, and we know at that time, obviously, the government in Nairobi was rather sympathetic uh, to the genocide there, so it was protecting a lot of them until 1997, so it, so it went to Arusha. Uh, later at the Sierra Leone court, we, we've built a court, you know, with a mix of national and international judges, and we held the trials all in, in, in Freetown. 
uh, uh, even after that city had been uh, <clears throat> had taken uh, and in which there were a lot of security considerations, but it was possible to do that, except when we got to the trial of Charles Taylor, uh, then the regional leaders told us they didn't want him there. They were afraid hostages would be taken. And so we had to move that case out. Uh, I thought we probably could have done the Taylor case just fine in, in, in Freetown. Um, you know, uh, you get if we got if this case had been in The Hague, I mean, the ICC so far has held all its trials in The Hague. It has the right to go uh, uh, do the Unwin case in Kampala or, or someplace else, uh, but hasn't done it or even hasn't, hasn't done oral arguments. They say there's security issues. But I think, um, you know, it, it, that's an awful long ways away. And uh, it was extremely important that this, this court be in Africa. Um, but, but obviously uh, the distance and, and, and the absolute impossibility of sort of driving back and forth between, the, between Kigali and, and Arusha uh, made it in, in a, really a different world. And so uh, it was a quite imperfect solution, which the court tried to do outreach on. I remember going out and showing films and even in the prisons and seeing the prisoners yell and scream when they saw the pictures of the guys in the prisons living so much better in Arusha than they were. Uh, I remember the, all of those efforts uh, but we know that that was really a minor thing compared to the fact that the trials weren't uh, accessible locally. And if you can do it locally, I just think it's a whole lot better. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm just following on from that. Um, we've had some questions and obviously one of the biggest questions about the legacy of ICTR is location of archives. It's, it's one thing to have a location of the court um, in terms of seeing justice being done. But then the all important legacy, especially as denial um, takes off in the last few years of, of having access to this all important archive. Now, and if you are researchers, uh, we've got a question here. You know, if you're uh, doing research on the genocide, um, you would definitely obviously go to Rwanda, but then you've also got to travel uh, Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, you've got to travel about a thousand kilometers to get to the actual archive of the crime. Um, so is the archive best in Arusha? If not, why is it there, do we think? And um, uh, what are the issues around it? Um, Barbara, do you want to have a go in an earnest? I'm sure we'll have something to, uh, to add. I feel very, very strongly that they should have located it in Arusha. And, and it's a real, disappointment that Inhibition. they did. I mean, I'm sorry, Kigali. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. I thought, but it just, just a bit of surprise. <laughs> right, but, you. you know, one of the things, there are two things that, you know, I think about this all the time. And, and it, you know, the our trial in a way, it, it reminds me of almost what they're doing in Congress right now with our our coup, you know, you know, the the January 6th, but it's like we do in depth kind of analysis or fact finding on on things that are of public interest, you know, a, a public official killed or something. And Rwanda, this is their history. I mean, the, the kind of detail that we have on the death of the prime minister, on what happened on those nights, the other political parties. I mean, this is this is Rwanda's, the government's, the, the nation's history. But even more important than that, it's the people's history. And so it, it's like we have detail of where people were killed where they were, if people are searching for, you know, where their family, you know, ended up and what happened and things like that. We have, you know, we have detailed information on that. There are other parts that may be of more interest to international lawyers somewhere, but I'm not that interested in that. Somebody else can figure that out. And that stuff is not uh, as protected. It, it can be done electronically. But but the one thing I want to talk about is the the idea of the the, the protected witnesses, and I think that when I left the tribunal, um, we had you know binders on every witness. We had all this research we had done. We had a case map. Which when I talked about the forty issues, we took every single word that was related to those issues and put them in a pile in that electronic database. So if you had a family that was around where um, you know, in, in Gitarama, and you think that they were killed up there, we may have information and we gathered all of it from our trial into those buckets. That should be <clears throat> definitely 
in Rwanda. But when I left the tribunal, I asked them, what, what should we do with this stuff? And they go, I don't know. We don't know what to do with it, you know? And, and it's like they had started the legacy uh, project, but they didn't, I left before it was, it was there. So I have a lot of the information myself. And I, and, you know, I'd like to just give it to Rwanda. I'm not sure, you know, what, what the protocol is, but, you know, there are things that, that they need to have. And so I think it's super important. So on the protected witnesses, we went back after the, the witnesses were done at, in the trial and we tried to round up as many witnesses as possible to talk to them. And I asked them, I said, you are a protected witness. Would you agree to have your testimony or would you agree to, um, to have it open? And most of them said yes. And, I, and the ones that were hesitant, I said, well, you know, in the United States, we have Public Records Act and we it's five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and it's open. Well, that stuff should be open. And one other thing that I want to make sure I talk about is the electronic um, disclosure system. All the information we had, all the evidence we had was opened up to the defense counsel in an electronic database system so that they could peruse it. Um, and it was basically because we had a duty to tell them exculpatory information. It was required by the court and it's a normal thing you do. So the defense counsel and all the defendants had, had access to all the information in the evidence unit in the electronic database. Rwanda should also have that. You know, I think that there's a time now where things should be opened up and they should be moved over uh, to the people that are really affected and that's the Rwandans. Thank you, thank you. Um, Ernest. Yes, um, I think it's a non-brainer. Um, they should be in Rwanda, full stop. And actually this is a speaking of legacy and, and if the international community would like to leave something for Rwanda, why could they just fund a documentary center in Rwanda and if there are issues that need to be detected because of the security or the safety of uh, uh, individual people, then that can be done. But that, these uh, archives should be in Rwanda. For me, there is not even, uh, it's not a non-brainer. Mm. Mm. Just, uh, and, 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 and I agree, uh, uh, keep in mind, uh, the tribunal still has some work to do uh, in, in, in the sense we have Kabuga who was just found to be competent and, and uh, would stand trial. And of course, our evidence in the media trial and things that were found there, uh, 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 particularly when he uh, went to uh, uh, defended RTLM before the Ministry of Information in, in February of, of 1994, et cetera, that there's uh, a lot of relevance uh, in the records. And sometimes you may find that the court needs uh, needs to have an original uh, or because it's challenged in terms of its, uh, of its accuracy. Uh, there's also a great deal of interest in other countries and prosecutions. Uh, and, and Rwanda, unlike some countries, is all if, if countries are prepared uh, to prosecute uh, uh, people for the genocide in third countries, and there have been, I think, more than 13 countries that have now convicted people uh, for crimes of the genocide abroad, often with Rwandan assistance. But, but I know for a fact that the tribunal gets regular requests uh, for that information. Uh, usually there are often lower level individuals that turn out from the refugee community that turn out to be uh, uh, to have been major killers and, and information as well from the files are shared on those cases. The three that were transferred over to Rwanda and of course there are others that people are arrested that will also be. So there, there is some need uh, to continue to, uh, to make sure that information is available for proceedings. But, uh, but, but fundamentally, at the end of the day, when you're thinking about where the archives should go, they should go to Rwanda. And if there are any particular security issues, uh, they should be uh, dealt with uh, uh, appropriately at that time. And, and, and the court continues to have a, a president, uh, now a president from Malta, who's doing a pretty good job, I think, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that can make these determinations. And frankly, when those other countries want protected witnesses, there's a procedure of sometimes for, getting consent from the witness and sharing that information. So uh, there, are, there are things that still need to be dealt with. I remember dealing in, uh, uh, at the, um, uh, uh, when I was ambassador at large for war crimes with, the, with, with records from the Nazi war crimes, the trials, particularly those held by the so-called uh, under the United Nations War Crimes Commission that were held in other countries. Those records have largely now been opened and, and placed in museums, but it took something like 75 years 
uh, to deal with the kind of privacy issues that were involved. So these things need to be worked out, but, but eventually they need to be uh, uh, in, in the country where these crimes happened and, and, uh, and whose people whose lives were lost and, and, and uh, people whose, whose whole history was affected. So that's, that, that should be our goal. Yeah, I, I have to say, I'm mean, speaking as a researcher myself, I found it hugely frustrating um, that I kept having to fly to, to Arusha, um, where they've got a beautiful million pound building there. But um, unfortunately, it's not as accessible. And the other area with archives, I suppose, is the fact, uh, again, as a researcher, I found it, you know, so much of the statements are so heavily redacted and so much are just not on a database at all. You, they don't even seem to exist um, because they were confidential or deemed confidential. And one understands there's protected witnesses, but a lot of it, it's opaque. You don't know why this stuff has been redacted. There's no explanation of why it's been done or not. Uh, and again, uh, it's, it's as good as not being there. So you've got these firsthand testimonies, often from the accused, but, uh, Joe Public is not allowed to see what the accused right. has confessed to. Uh, and that is frustrating. And as you said, Stephen, you know, the, the, the United Nations War Crimes Commission took 2017, so 75 years till uh, they opened Security Council deemed those archives open. In fact, the Wiener Library in London is, is hosting them in the UK. Uh, you know, we don't really want to, to, to wait till 2068 before we uh, get access, because uh, um, I, my research days will be long gone by that stage. Um, uh, anyway, lovely. Let's let's move on to uh, another question we've got. Um, now, here's a, here's a tricky one. Uh, it's been addressed to Barbara, and good luck with this, Barbara. Uh, but any, please, uh, any of you uh, jump in here. Uh, is the sudden change of laws during the in trial the reason why most of the convicts? I'm um, not sure most, but certainly many of the convicts got a shorter sentence and others were acquitted. To what ex extent did the change of law affect the ruling? Now, we're not lawyers, or at least I'm not. Um, but I think, think effectively that it was a big shock, I think, in Rwanda that people who had got life sentences, uh, for example, Neymana, um, and now obviously it's, he's a free man roaming around Europe. Um, and a lot of the uh, sentences were were slashed. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you can draw a correlation, actually. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, some of the things, the, the laws or the, the Court of Appeals um, excluded evidence often because um, the rules had changed on indictments, how they were written, and also notification, things like that. And so I, I, what comes to mind, and I was looking at it earlier, is the rape of the prime minister. And I just use that because it's an, it's an incident that, that I know of. And, and it's like they, it went up to the court of appeals and they, they, um, they reversed it because we hadn't given the notification correctly, you know, the notification to the defendant. I mean, and th those were the kinds of things, if they actually looked at the records, you know, it, it, was, it was untrue, but there were certain laws and certain requirements that, that went into effect while we were in trial that, that, caused, that gave them a, a way to reverse. And I think the Court of Appeals themselves I had, uh, I like our, our new judge, <laughs> the new judge, but, but the previous court, it, it's almost, I felt like they were sitting there far, far away, having no idea of the context and they were waiting to get the, get the trial and then show how smart they were about law, you know? And, and the law itself, you know, it, it's like law is a tool to evaluate the facts, but you know, the, the laws weren't very, very tailored to this kind of situation. And so they, they excluded a lot of the evidence that the trial court had admitted. So it was a real problem. And it is why a lot of them, like Anatole Singiumva got out in 15 years for genocide and all the things that he did. It was just absolutely, absolutely appalling. And, and so many different parts of this, it, it was the Court of Appeals just gutted our cases. 
They didn't know anything about Rwanda. They didn't know anything about what we were doing in court. You know, they're looking at the law. I mean, give me, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm much, I, I'm, I obviously have strong feelings about this, but I, I'm, I, I think I agree with the gist of the question that there were things that, that, that shouldn't have happened because, you know, the court, especially the court of appeals, um, it's, 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 on it it's, uh, in the same way and Barbara's correct I mean a lot of times it was over these notice things and and they did really move the ball on that the the, the indictments were uh, the initial indictments were much more general and then uh, and of course some of the early investigation wasn't very good it was only when the witness came to Arusha and you really talked to him at length uh, we didn't even have attorneys in the early days that could do interviews over in Rwanda that we would find out additional important details and we would give the defense notice and more time to prepare or to come up and it, so it wouldn't be a surprise. And so everybody knew what was coming. Uh, and then later on they said, oh, because it wasn't in the indictment or it wasn't put in the pretrial brief three years ago, uh, they would knock that out. That wouldn't happen in an American court or in, in, in other courts. Even in a civil law system, they'd go back to the administrative judge, the judge who could, or the prosecutor could add that. And so it was kind of a, uh, and, and quite often it didn't affect uh, the sentence. They would just knock out various uh, uh, various acts, but in several cases that caused people not to be convicted of certain crimes and for their sentences to be shortened. The other thing was on command responsibility, and and it obviously affected the Bagasora case, uh, where he was, you know, um, certainly in, in my view. I mean, we have to deal with who's the most responsible. Uh, uh, I would say he is the most, uh, you know, uh, responsible for, for making the genocide happen. And, uh, and he got life sentence appropriately. But uh, things like the conviction of rape uh, and genocide were on command responsibility because he was the, essentially the head of the defense ministry for the, in the early part of, the, of, of April. And the judges attributed all of that to him. And, uh, and the judges in The Hague took the position, well, because he's the big shot and he's not out there doing it actively, he's less responsible. And that, uh, when we dealt with that at the Special Court for Sierra Leone, our judges had exactly the opposite view. He's more responsible than, 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 the, than, than, than the people that have been forced or pushed. And of course, they've done horrible things, but I mean, they've been recruited into it and incited into it and doped into it and whatever. Uh, the people on top are the ones that are the most responsible. And, and that was just completely wrongheaded. And, and uh, the same kind of thing then resulted in, in, in sentences that were life getting shortened. Like Nahimanas got shortened to 35 years and Gaze to 35. Uh, and then um, because the, the courts uh, integrated with Yugoslavia and the sentences there were so short, they, they'd established this sort of European idea that they'd get out after two thirds. And, and that was never in the rules. Uh, and it was envisioned that if somebody got out early, it was because they'd done something for it. They'd acknowledged their guilt. They'd helped them for their investigations. They'd helped find fugitives. They'd done something. Good behavior. And, and they just made it automatic. And, and that's how Naimana got out in, 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 uh, uh, in 20, uh, from, you know, from 2016, from the time he was arrested in Cameroon. Uh, fortunately, there was a change in leadership, and uh, when 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 Engeze came up, I mean, I actually filed something that said, you know, 35 year sentence, to serve 23. This guy could actually go out and start inciting uh, other violence elsewhere. He's such a he's such a, a, a huckster. Uh, he would. Uh, he'd probably get good on uh, social media, uh, and uh, this would be a real danger. How could you let this guy out? But in any case, the, so far the new president hasn't incorporated the one third rule. And at the special court for Sierra Leone, our judges established a principle, nobody gets out unless they've shown contrition, unless they've gone through certain steps. Mm -hmm. And then there's a period of kind of monitoring and supervision uh, for a period of time to make sure that they actually are complying with this. Uh, I think that's required. Uh, it would be in most cr criminal justice systems and certainly for the, the Im immense crimes that are committed here for people, frankly, that serve less than a life sentence is, is, is unreasonable. Uh, Bagasora has left us, uh, otherwise there would be a day that he would be released and that would be really tragic. Absolutely, I think, I mean, he did apply for early release and he didn't get it, but mm -hmm. had he applied for early release probably three or four years before he did, um, it, it, he may well have done. Um, Ernest, did, did you have anything from a Rwandan perspective there? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I haven't worked on those cases, so I don't have any particular, First hand knowledge about it, but what what people were saying, and I, I knew the former 
the former president of the ICTY, who also was uh, from uh, covering uh, the ICTR. Uh, people were finding it really hard to understand how these guys were getting uh, early releases. Now, of course, if the judge says, I'm going by the regulations, by the rules, there's very little you can do. But I see, believe that as, uh, as Stephen said, there could be a rule like the one that they had in Sierra Leone uh, uh, Special Tribunal, which indeed uh, put in conditions uh, before a release is granted, which I don't think was there for the ICTR, ICTR uh, for one. Mm. Uh, until, yeah, and, and now it's de facto there, but they still haven't adopted it. We did, did seem to be, you know, so for, for, for several years, different rules for different courts and different appeal courts and, um, you know, ICTR, ICTY judges, um, an awful lot of dissenting opinions. So it seemed to be a matter of uh, who you got. Um, you know, you couldn't actually tell what the sentence was going to be um, until you saw the judge, which obviously does tend to bring the, the whole point into disrepute somewhat. Um, let's just move on to, a, to another subject. Um, you've just got how many minutes? Oh, we've, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I just want to come back to, to issues of how you see the legacy, this all important legacy. I know that the ICTR spent huge amounts of money on making very nice videos, which you can see if you go to its site on the legacy of the court. But moving forwards, um, obviously we've now got war crimes investigators going over to the Ukraine, um, obviously involved with, with Syria and other conflict zones as well. What can you take away from the ICTR um, that is positive, that can be used, you know, uh, if there is a war crimes tribunal set up for Ukraine, for example, for future um, genocides, what can they learn from this, let's face it, very expensive and very long process in Arusha? Uh, does anyone want to jump in there first and good luck? <laughs> uh, Ernest. Yeah, I will, I, I will jump in because obviously, uh, uh, the jurisprudence, uh, you know, except for these uh, uh, sometimes technical issues on evidence and notice, I think is is quite strong. Uh, the Akesu case, as Barbara talked about earlier, the first case that found that rape uh, was an act of genocide. Uh, uh, you know, even if the victim were not killed, it was it was a way in which uh, the Tutsi uh, people were, uh, were were destroyed, and that was what was intended. The, the kind of humiliation and, and destruction of women and the whole family unit and everything that that, that, that followed, and and that was an extremely important precedent to to show to. To reach, to use command responsibility, uh, to reach up the chain. Now, highly relevant in a case like a Putin case, uh, uh, to a Bagasora or to a Prime Minister Kambanda, uh, for what's happening out. Uh, their their hands uh, have no. There's no blood or uh, under their fingernails. Uh, they're they're keeping their hands clean, but they're making these these things happen. And so, this is an important principle. And the and the whole idea of incitement. Uh, um, uh, to genocide and, and persecution as a crime against humanity and the ways in which hate speech can lead to violence, uh, uh, even when it's not on a, uh, on a on a racial or ethnic basis. I mean, we use that to, to, to deal with crimes against Hutus that were protecting Tutsis uh, and they were convicted, people convicted of the crime against humanity then, uh, even though it wasn't uh, uh, between ethnic groups. And so uh, there, there are, there's extremely valuable law here that, that, that's, that's been established. The other thing uh, is that it was an international cooperative effort. I mean, the real tragedy, and, and we only began to correct it in 2002, and uh, Barbara eventually had a, a member of, of her team that came from Rwanda, uh, but uh, the strangest thing we arrived, when I arrived there in 2001, there were no Rwandans working in the place. <laughs> there were people from 82 countries, the only Rwandans were in interpretation. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and at least in OTP and two in the Office of the Prosecutor, we began by hiring uh, uh, assistant uh, sort of uh, legal advisors, et cetera, that uh, began to uh, uh, work uh, within our trial teams. Uh, at least we, we've um, changed that in places like Sierra Leone, where two thirds of the employees were from the country. Mm. Uh, these things really need, need, need to be changed. But, but the fact that it was an international court and people came together from different legal systems and different approaches to civil law, common law, and, 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 and resolved these issues and made decisions, as, as Ernest said, 
like the 2006 decision that <laughs> the genocide was a matter of judicial notice, uh, that it was full and completely established and none of the trials that followed. Did we have to offer a single item of proof uh, that there was a genocide in Rwanda? The question was, was this guy responsible for it? Mm -hmm. Uh, these, these, were, these were extremely important decisions. We also got cooperation around the world. I mean, <laughs> the genocidal government had been defeated uh, by the RPF. I mean, uh, won, uh, won the war, lost so many, 70% uh, uh, of the Tutsis in Rwanda before the genocide. Uh, uh, horrendous, but, uh, but that were these uh, <laughs> perpetrators, helped by the French to some extent, from Operation Turquoise areas, got out. Uh, we chased them up in 27 different countries, right? All the way to Laredo, Texas, you know, in the case of Reverend Nataka Rudamana, and, and put out <laughs> warrants and uh, requests for cooperation that were honored. And, and, and those people <laughs> were, were brought uh, to, uh, uh, to trial uh, in, in, in Arusha. Obviously, there's still a few fugitives we've now found out. Sadly, Emperania is no longer with us. Uh, 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 Kabuga has been arrested. There are at least four of the those that are to be sent to Rwanda that I think are still alive and need to be uh, transferred. But, but the, the fact that you could get international cooperation in four hemispheres uh, to bring these people to, to court, uh, I think is an, an extremely important principle. And, and other courts have not had anywhere near that success in reaching out broadly uh, for, for cooperation of, of states uh, everywhere. So there are, there are positive uh, elements of it that need to be built upon. And, uh, and, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see that in the work of the ICC or in special tribunals that may be established in the future. Thank you, thanks so much. And yeah, some very, very interesting thoughts there. Um, Barbara, would you, do you want to, how do you see in a couple of minutes just to- uh... yeah. one, of the, one of the things that I was thinking about while Steve was talking and, you know, it's, it's, it's encouraging I, you know, we've all traveled it around to different places and and, and talked about it. But I, I was in um, Guatemala, and Rio Smot was the president there, and he was actually tried for genocide. So I was there um, talking to the community groups, and um, when I started telling them about the gachacha, I mean, because our tribunal was a very small part of all all of this. I mean, we, there was over a million gachacha cases and tens of thousands of national cases. And once I brought up the gachachas, the, the Guatemalans were very interested. They wanted to hear more about the gachachas than the tribunal. And, and you know, it's like wherever you go, I was in, it was in Nanjing and um, outside Shanghai, and, and they, were, they were so interested in hearing about the, the trials and the, and the genocide because they had the, the, the Nanjing massacres, you know, everybody has, there's in the Armenians in Los Angeles. I mean, they, they want to hear about it. I, I, you know, there are so many similarities once you start talking to other countries and other people, um, you know, about problems that they've had. So, and there's also a lot of different solutions. And so I think it's, it's going to be a putting different parts together, you know, and, and I was very pleased that Ukraine uh, the Ukraine national courts um, have already started trying cases, and that that's encouraging. And you know, it, it, it's um, it, it's it's a big it's a huge burden, you know, to have to you know. I was I've heard so many Rwandans talk about it after the genocide and trying to figure out what to do, you know, and what what's coming next, and you know, and, and, and everything was devastated. And, you know, the idea of the gachachas was just so brilliant in my mind and, you know, the, and, the, and the trials they did. So one of the things that I wanted to say, and I, and I just wanted to make sure, um, if they said, if anybody ever sets up another tribunal for a genocide, don't also include crimes that the other part, I mean, we, we had both, the, not, they, I always think of the RPF investigations as almost like charging a rape victim with a crime. You know, I, I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but to have the two in the same ballpark was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, and I, as a practitioner in the middle of this, I am, I'm all the way over here on the genocide and, and, and we're having problems with the, with, with the communication sometimes with Rwanda because 
they're they're over there trying to investigate RPF crimes at the same time. I mean, it made no sense to me whatsoever. And, and I really hope that in the future that they're more sensitive about this, you know, about what happens. And also what Steve talked about with, with having the Rwandans at the tribunal, I mean, we, there were many different stories, but Jean-Baptiste and Zanzarero was, uh, was the Rwandan that came on our team. And it was one of the most incredible days in court because he was second in charge of the gendarmes in Rwanda and he's, and he's Hutu. He walked in and sat down at our council table and the defense went crazy. It's like, you can't have him here. That's not fair. You know, it makes no sense. He's one of, uh, you know, it was just, and he was so invaluable. But up until then, Rwandans were not allowed, you know, but on the defense side, they were there, you know? And so it was, it was a very strange situation. We had a lawyer um, that, that was a, a, a Tutsi that was a Ugandan Tutsi and she was hired by the tribunal and they wouldn't let her do certain things because she was a Tutsi. I mean, you know, it was like <laughs> doing. So anyway, it's, it's, it was so important. And Jean Baptiste was mm. absolutely stunningly wonderful yeah. part of yeah. our team. Absolutely. Well, I'll go along with that because he's been a huge help with, with, uh, with my him. research as well. Absolutely. <laughs> he's he's uh, just so, so great. If you're watching John Baptiste, thank you so yes. much from all of us. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, obviously the lesson there is, you know, there has to be local involvement. You know, it, it, if, if you're trying a crime, if you're, you know, if something had happened in, in, you know, in the UK or the USA, it would seem remarkable if you had, you know, a court in Africa with uh, mostly Africans running it. Uh, it, it does seem uh, one of the starting points uh, which Gachacha addressed so, so, so well. Uh, Ernest, um, have you any sort of last or final thought? We're just a few minutes, a couple of minutes over, so we'll, we'll keep it fairly brief. Uh, Richard, I'll be very brief and, and simply to say that uh, the ICTR demonstrated that the fight against impunity is one which can be won. Mm. And I believe that uh, whatever everybody has said about the ICC and uh, other mm. ad hoc tribunals, uh, we actually build on what has, was done in Arusha and mm. in, in, in The Hague, of course. Uh, so in my view, this is the way to go. We simply can't uh, let these criminals go unpunished simply because, uh, well, it's too, it costs too much money. It mm. is none of our business. It's happening in Africa or in Ukraine at this time. Mm. And by the way, just, just to finish, I remember when I joined the ICC, people were very critical about the ICC, uh, saying that uh, the court is there only for African leaders. And I used to tell them, give it 10 years. Give it 10 years or 15 years. Now here we are. We are now in Ukraine. We are now in Venezuela. We are now in Afghanistan. We are in everywhere. So uh, this is the way to go. And we've got to do everything possible to put an end to the culture of impunity. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not just impunity, but I would add denial there as well, because that's been raising its very ugly head at the minute. Uh, and one of the, uh, you know, I do knock the ICTR and I have done, but, you know, in terms of establishing what happened, and I say this, this wonderful archive, which is a, a lot of it is online, so for researchers, it's a vital tool, even if you can't get to Arusha. Um, and let us hope that national jurisdictions, for example, the UK, which has still got uh, our case going on since 2006, uh -huh. uh, which is beginning to make the Bagasura case look short-winded, uh, our politicians here in the UK and in France and Belgium and other, uh, other places where these, uh, these perpetrators still hide will start take seriously. Uh, it's easy to knock the ICTR, but at least they got to grips uh, with the cases they had. Um, and for those um, still watching, of course, you've got the Kabuga case, which um, uh, as Steve referred to, is only just just the last couple of days, I think, the, just, just, just this week, they've decided he is fit to stand trial, though in The Hague, not in Arusha. So uh, that trial, no doubt, will also hopefully produce a huge amount of new information, uh, which will testify to what 
occurred in Rwanda. So may I just thank Barbara and Steve and Ernest uh, and everyone and Catherine uh, and Eric for uh, the idea and uh, for everyone who's joined us tonight. Uh, it's been um, it's been a joy to see you all again. Uh, and this is a very important subject, and I hope um, you know the discussion will continue. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone.